Hurricanes actually typically begin as something called tropical disturbances, and I don't want to spend too much time on these details. You can look at these details in the book, but essentially it's something like this. The ocean heats up the atmosphere, that air rises, that air is carrying with it latent heat because it's got water vapor. As that latent heat condenses, it releases its, as that water vapor condenses, it releases its latent heat to the atmosphere, causing even more of an updraft. It's something called cumulonimbus convection. Those towering cumulus clouds that you see sometimes in the summertime over our mountains, or if you travel back east, you see these thundering tower heads. That's an example of cumulonimbus convection, and it's because water vapor rises, re, uh, condenses, releasing its latent heat, causing even more of a, uh, atmospheric heating and rising, and air rushes in to replace that rising air. As that air rushes in to replace the rising air, it begins to turn because of the Coriolis effect, and a tropical disturbance can turn into a hurricane. That's sort of a rough and dirty recipe for how hurricanes form. Winds forming or winds converging both at the top and the bottom um, create different kinds of processes that contribute to the circulation of a hurricane. And one thing I think people don't understand or, or realize is a hurricane, again, is a three-dimensional system. Winds coming in from one direction at the surface, spiraling upwards and moving outwards aloft in the upper, sort of the upper part of a hurricane, and it's at upper hurricane circulation is just as important as lower circulation, as lower hurricane circulation, and so the three-dimensional movement of air through a hurricane is really important, both to its formation, to its intensity, and whether that hurricane sticks around or not. If the outflow of air at the top, because air is rushing at the surface, spiraling upwards and moving outwards in an anticyclonic direction along the surface of the hurricane. If that outflow of air is inhibited, then the hurricane re is reduced in intensity. And a lot of times it's wind shear, so winds blowing over the top of the hurricane or other kinds of atmospheric conditions that can slow down a hurricane that are just interfering with its winds aloft. So again, complex, but not so complex that you can't understand some of the details of it. All right, let's look at some figures. Um, and here's the recipe. This is figure 827 from the book. You can look at this. It really requires a lot of warm water above 80 degrees or more. And actually, we want about uh, 75 to 100 meters, maybe not quite that much, 200 feet we put here, of ocean water that's above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a heat required to cause enough evaporation and enough release of latent heat to generate the wind patterns and generate the flows, the surface flows of air as well as the flows aloft that you need to keep a hurricane or get a hurricane going. So we have to have a warm ocean first of all. Now it has to be that deep because once the winds start blowing we get that wind turbulent mixing and colder water comes up and that can shut it down right away. So we want water that's at least 80 degrees, if not warmer. We want water that's also pretty deep with that 80 degree water because just the action of the hurricane itself can stir up that water and make it cold and shut down a hurricane before it even gets started. So that's the first part. Winds converging as that air rises off the ocean, as that water vapor rises off the ocean, winds converge from the surface those winds rise, it makes it unstable. As that, as that air rises, it begins to release latent heat, which adds extra energy, extra cumulonimbus convection, supplies more latent heat energy. There really has to be enough humidity in here to make this air rise to 18,000 feet or so. And then winds here have to be favorable enough so it doesn't rip the top of the hurricane apart. Um, and really upper atmosphere high pressure pumps this rising air away from the hurricane. So there has to be high pressure here that's moving air away from the hurricane and it actually moves it in an anti-cyclonic direction. Remember the air circulation down here for a cyclone is cyclonic or in the northern hemisphere counterclockwise. The top part of a hurricane is actually rotating in the opposite direction as that air is being pumped away because it can't, you have to have the pump out to 
fuel the ability of the air to come in. And it's all this combination of circumstances that create a hurricane. So it's no surprise that really only about 10% or so of the potential of hurricanes develop into full-fledged hurricane. So a tropical disturbance and sometimes even a tropical weather system or storm or a tropical wave um, of those that are formed, only about 10% turn into hurricanes. And even a smaller number of those turn into intense hurricanes because the recipe for a hurricane is pretty specific. A lot of different things have to go on to create that hurricane. Well, here's another image, another way of looking at a hurricane uh, from the book. And here we can see the central part, clear part of a hurricane is called the eye. And when you get eye formation, it's usually indicative of a very well-formed hurricane. Here you see the rising air. So here air is coming, uh, converging low-level air as water is, as air is heated and it rises. It's causing winds to come in and turn to the right, giving that sort of, uh, cyclonic circulation again counterclockwise going up and as it turns out this rising air is then drawn off this diverging upper level air is drawn off if we were to look down upon this you'd see the upper part of the hurricane rotating in an anti-cyclonic fashion the lower part in the inter part of the interior here in a cyclonic fashion and actually we get subsidence of air in the in the eye itself because Air rising up here and then cooling here creates another pattern of sinking air in the middle of the eye that causes this region to be cloud free and clear. Just like a high pressure system over us creates clear sky conditions, it's this localized high pressure at the top of the eye of the hurricane that creates that clear eye wall. One other major feature of hurricanes are these spiral rain bands and spiral rain bands, generally this is a the better way to look at them, are really the more intense parts of the hurricane. A hurricane isn't one complete uh, storm in itself. Um, it's really in some ways a cluster of storms. And as this system moves through, anybody that's, is, that experiences a hurricane is going to experience periods of great intense winds and rain when the spiral rain bands are passing over, followed by periods of less rain and wind uh, in between these spiral rain bands as a hurricane is moving over you. Another important aspect of hurricanes, especially already formed hurricanes, is this phenomenon of upwelling. So as a hurricane is moving across the ocean, it's actually because of low pressure here at this part of the hurricane, it's actually creating both wind mixing as well as creating a kind of dome of water and sucking the water up and creating upwelling. And we actually have satellite images as hurricanes pass over the surface of the ocean, they leave behind a trail of cold water. That cold water has been pumped up from the surface and because that cold water is full of nutrients, we actually see phytoplankton blooms following in the trails of hurricanes. And the importance of hurricanes to ocean productivity has recently been studied, uh, and it, it may turn out to be a significant source of productivity to the ocean. These hurricane events that cause the ocean to stir up, cause phytoplankton productivity, and also cause, of course, when the phytoplankton are active, the rest of the parts of the food web are active as well. And so hurricanes may actually contribute to ocean productivity in an important way.